Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So I would like to speak about the uh, um, uh, the epidemiological uh, situation around the uh, near health in Russia and the world. So as a scientist, as a representative of the National uh, Research Institute for Neurological Health, And uh, let me just right off the bat say that uh, we are mostly into applied scientists, science, of course, not, not the fundamental science. So I'll speak about the actual situation on the ground uh, in the applied areas, i.e. in a daily life. So I hope you can see my slides. Let's begin. Хорошо, тогда пойдем <coughs> таким образом. Коллеги, давайте сначала остановимся на понятии определения психического здоровья. So, first of all, let's define mental health uh, to begin with. Uh, let me spend just a couple of moments of my time just to give you definition, okay? And uh, to define cognitive health versus mental health. According to WHO, uh, it's a well-being uh, and a well-being where a human being can actually exercise his capabilities, can resist uh, stress, can be productive, high performance, and can be a productive member of society. So in this particular regard, I believe that uh, cognitive health is a lot to do with uh, personal well-being, personal health, uh, personal happiness. A lot of that, surprisingly, uh, is to do with just how happy you are. So this is a mental health. So this is the composition of the mental health. This is what, I mean, the psychology, the psychic uh, level of the human being is. There are three big parts. Of course, there are uh, like a certain, like more of a stable structure, such as psychic properties, psychic processes, and uh, this mental processes that are mostly related to cognition, emotion, willpower, things like that. So, uh, when it comes to cognition, which is here circled in red, uh, that is only a part. This is not everything. This is only a big, it's a big part, but it's only a part of a mental health care. So, speaking of cognitive health uh, versus mental health, I think that we're sort of narrowing down the mental health because it's a bigger thing. So, cognition, yes, but it's only a part. It's a sub-element of the mental health. And I think, of course, trying to reduce uh, discrimination and stigma. Uh, but per se, mental health is not the same as cognitive health. So mental is bigger than cognitive. Cognitive is only about thinking, learning, and memory. Let's say a person with good cognitive health is a person who can think, learn, and remember, OK? So therefore, cognition is an important element of the brain health, but it's only a part of the brain. So this is very, very important to understand the difference. So, and to have good cognition, uh, to have good cognitive health means that the brain is fit and to ready and ready to carry out life and work demands. This is, by the way, straight from the U.S. literature. This is just the copy paste from the U.S. And they give the de definition and the difference between the cognitive and the mental. So that's the big difference. So if you can think, if you can learn, if you can remember, in that particular sense, uh, I think that you can throw baby with the water by missing out on the multitude of other areas where it's also very, very important. So uh, I'm just warning you to not turn into this Oscar situation where, uh, you know, that uh, unfortunately the Oscar ceremony um, has been blamed for stigma and discrimination and they missed out on a lot of important elements by trying to be too politically correct. So when it comes to cognitive uh, functions, so it should be just mechanistic. Uh, so of course cognitive disorders have very clear men so clinical disorders, but we try to elevate ourselves to a high level. So mental health is of course an integral part of oral health and if you look at the who 1948 it says that the mental health 
is a full physical, uh, spiritual, and social well-being. So even if you have a social mental issues, you can still be uh, mentally healthy in certain moments of your time. So it's not a permanent thing, it's not a constant. Very, very important to understand that. So, and the level of mental health, uh, I mean, or the mental health of society uh, or the country, of course, has to deal with social, psychological, biological, and uh, lots of other factors. We all know that uh, certain difficulties uh, in life, certain problems at work, uh, maybe violence, maybe sexual harassment, uh, social stigma, uh, unhealthy lifestyle, or just the physical health issues or violation of human rights. All these factors can cause negative impact and can cause mental uh, disorders. Of course, there are also personal factors uh, that uh, make people particularly vulnerable and susceptible uh, to uh, mental health and uh, mental health issues. Uh, and of course, there's also biological factors and things like that. So anyways, um, and it's a global problem, by the way. This is the plague of the modern day society. Over 100 million are suffering from anxiety and depression. Over 21 billion, million people suffer from alcohol-related disorders. Uh, oh, this is Europe alone. The Europe alone, think about it. Out of 170 million people living in Europe, over 100 have anxiety and depression, 21 million suffer from alcohol-related disorders, over 7 million people suffer from Alzheimer's and other types of dementia, so over 4 million are schizophrenic, so 4 million bipolar, right, and bipolar-related diseases, and another 4 million are uh, suffering from panic attacks. So there you go, you do the math. So basically every fourth person in this, that moment in your life are uh, sort of is facing some sort of a cognitive and mental uh, issue. And according to WG, so this has to do with urbanization, uh, poor environment, so information uh, pressing, uh, technogenic uh, related things are uh, also brain damage and uh, pre-born uh, conditions also I mean damage to physical and reproductive health uh, migration um, lots of things so social economic and all the things in our life essentially all of them are causing this kind of effect oh by the way and if you're not unless you're a professional of course let me give you a context this is a classification an international as a classification of different disorders okay this is a well-known international classification so this is what we're currently using at the moment so uh, this has uh everything from schizophrenia to and this is also for adults and for juveniles as well so you see all sorts of emotional disorders behavior disorders uh psyche disorders schizophrenia and uh dementia etc etc so lots and lots this is a very very well studied area that's what i'm saying so the question is why would you even study mental health of the population why is it so important so the thing is that um so when you study a particular person an archetype yeah, you can infer you can connect the dots and so and therefore you can actually look at patterns and therefore you can then uh, launch particular counteractive measures to um, combat uh, these kind of elements in the society so and uh, of course we've been running the statistics uh, for years such as you know total number of uh, so neurological diseases versus total number of populations so we have a certain formula is usually per thousand people and uh, uh, the spread uh, of course the spread such as the prevalence the prevalence meaning the total number of cases per a hundred thousand people on a 12 month basis this can be primary and this can be secondary so this is what we've been tracking uh, for for years now uh, so, and this can be any particular, any particular disease. So, okay. So, and if we see that a particular disease is more prevalent, then we focus our efforts uh, on that. But, 
Uh, but the fact that there's more prevalence doesn't necessarily mean that it's aggravating. It means that there's certain concentration of people that have uh, similar disorders. And uh, uh, sometimes it has to do with testing. The fact that you are providing more visibility gives you more prevalence. And of course, latest technology has been very, very helpful here. So I just look at the statistics, that's in 16,019. This is for Russia. Uh, just, to, just to give a glimpse of the trends. This is what's been happening here. And these are mental disorders all across Russia, across the board, okay? And uh, this is number of patients, of course, uh, with uh, psychological disorders. And the total number of people uh, has been around 4 million people, generally, by and large. And we see a very slight reduction of the total number of head counts. Uh, but when it comes to heavy disorders, such as psychotic, manic, psychotic, schizophrenia, etc., he said that's about a quarter. And of that, uh, about less than half a million that are people that are schizophrenic. It may be about 50% in total overall occurrence, in total overall prevalence are the so-called non-psychotic or like a borderline disorders, as we call it. And these are mild symptoms, these are mild uh, light effects that are not uh, necessarily related to, you know, taking pills and things like that. So you can actually stay at home and you can get treatment uh, on like basis for pills and uh, not necessarily being taken care in a hospital. So you can also see that the non-psychotic component is actually more about 70% on a total basis. Now, and by the way, if you look at uh, the past 20 years, uh, this is for two decades, this is 100,000 people, so from the year 2000 all the way to 2019, uh, you see that th this is a distribution here. All, uh, all neurological diseases versus non-psychotic versus psychotic and mental dementia. Uh, so you see these bars, and I see close to 2008, it was going up, up, up. Then you see a very, very slight reduction, very uh, gradual reduction, then a bit of an elevation close to 2013. But other than that, uh, by and large, you don't see uh, any sharp spikes here. So more or less, it's quite level. So it's been quite steady here. And uh, this trend is quite benign, generally speaking. So, and uh, uh, like I said, about 50% would be non, uh, non. So, with the so-called borderline cases and some of the primary uh, mental disease. And uh, this a lot has to do with all the turbulence that's been happening in Russia since the 90s. You see the elevations, sharp spikes. Of course, 2004. Clearly, the banking crisis. Uh, then, of course, we see a reduction, then a slight bump in 2008, and then you see again going up uh, a little bit. This is a primary cases. Uh, not surprisingly, of course, a lot of that has to do with the social tension and uh, all the struggles that are people coming through. So, I mean, there's a strong correlation here. And for us as clinical researchers, of course, uh, by and large, as for us, uh, primary dementia, you see by and large, the trend is quite casey, of course. And uh, as far as psychotics and uh, a mental dementia is flat. So, and this, 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 this gives us uh, patterns. Uh, you can actually rank order all parts of Russia according to cases. So, and uh, you see different colors here, and uh, because we are studying it all across Russia for the different areas of Russia. So, these big maps, heat maps, that tell us uh, what's really happening. So I'm not saying this is uh, cast in stone, no, of course not. But this is a good indication of what's really happening to people that live in these parts of Russia. So such as when it's too elevated, such as the Republic of Bashkortostan or the Ninetsk, which is the far uh, extreme north, or the Perm region. So you see that uh, it's quite a spread. And uh, this is what we see in primary and secondary cases um, for 2019. You see a very low uh, levels in the south, right? Uh, uh, northwest, also very low. It's not because uh, the overall situation is better. I guess it has to do with also testing. And narcology related, uh, of course, um, you also see the spread here. This is mostly alcohol and other psychoactive drugs. Uh, by the way, very similar, uh, very similar 
in terms of oral cases and uh, primary cases as well. This is narcology related to drugs and uh, substances of abuse. Now, I have to mention one thing. I have to mention one thing in terms of identification and testing. A lot of that has to do with technology, of course. The question is, do you have the right technology? Do you have the right tests? So we compared the northwest part and the North Caucasus, different parts of Russia, the uh, north versus the south. And you see a level of technology. Uh, so, of course, in the northwest, they have two more 4.5 times better technology compared to the South, because the South is usually Southern Republics, they've always been notoriously known for poor technology. So you can definitely tell that um, the ability to test and therefore identify these cases is directly linked with uh, the availability of tools. Now, let's look at the global situation, okay? This is a share of population with mental health and substance uh, use disorder. Okay, so different methodology has been used, of course, there's no one single methodology, and there are very, very few research that uh, can give you sort of apples to apples a situation, but there have been multiple attempts like that. So uh, on this slide, you can see that uh, the darker the color, of course, uh, the more pronounced it. Uh, it is so i can say russia is somewhere in the middle so we can almost like i say russia is more of a favorable jurisdiction here compared to the united states or australia or some european countries now this is a share of population with mental health and substance use disorder and uh, here you see the trend of from 1990 to 2017 and uh, this is our span of 30 years uh, so and a lot of people say that uh, lately it's been all about psychotic disorders and things like that, that the mental health has been worse and worse. But it's not true. It's not true. It's actually been quite flat. It's quite flat. And uh, at the same time, the WHO, uh, that this is a 17 different countries, so it gives you a 12-month basis in April 2009. You see quite a big distribution from the United States to Nigeria. Okay, there's a vocal mental health uh, differences, and of course, United States, number one, running it uh, uh, with big lead, and uh, Nigeria is uh, the last. Well, there's nothing to get disordered about, I guess, in Nigeria. So anyways, uh, similar, uh, this is still WHO, this is this from the United States to Nigeria, it's the same slide, but in numbers. Number of cases, of course, heavy cases versus light cases, and the number of psychiatrists, by the way. And despite the fact that some of these disorders are like psychotic, mental dementia, and things like that, that means they're actually quite low percentages. So the bulk of these disorders I will call light cases or borderline cases, such as the person walking down the street, you wouldn't even know it. Okay, um, and this is brand new. Uh, this is from uh, the European part of WHO. Again, this is a spread. You see uh, the colors, the darker the color, the less and the lighter the color, the more. Okay, so Russia, again, a favorable jurisdiction in this regard. Oh, by the way, uh, quite lately, it's been a lot of uh, studies of depression, anxiety. Uh, as you know, a lot of people that say are depressed, uh, all sorts of psychosomatic uh, disorders related to anxiety, depression, things like that. So uh, this is the, the D-A-L-Y. Uh, index. Uh, the United States is number one, then comes European Union, then Southeast Asia, then the South Pacific, the southern part of it, then the Middle East, and then Africa. And this has to do with loss of life or loss of longevity related to, uh, so it used to be less than 20%, but now it's quite elevated. Also, according to WHO, 2005, the share of uh, Neurological disease, about 20%, 28% of the total index. That's a depression, they say depression, or unipolar depression is actually ahead of cardiovascular disorders and other types of disorders in terms of its contribution to the index. So it's a massive, massive problem. So 25%, uh, that's what they say in terms of the frequency of depression. So it's a very widespread, and, and it's widespread across different demographics. Uh, there's been so many different studies from young to old here in Russia and abroad. They say that the women are twice as high actually susceptible to depression compared to men. You see, uh, 20 to 25 versus 7 to 12 percent. Interestingly enough, yeah, uh, so uh, 
there's a general trend uh, to uh, people getting younger or want to live forever, trying to improve the lifestyle. And the more they try to do it, the more depressive they get. So a lot of that is chronic. Over 60% cases of depression are chronic, reoccurring, and also a high uh, uh, level of correlation to other types of diseases, neurologic um, and uh, other non-neurologic phobias, uh, etc. And a lot of suicides, 15% more suicides uh, caused by depression. Uh, and it's actually the suicides actually is a more prevalent disease than uh, cardiovascular. Actually, more people die from suicide than from cardiovascular disease, which is interesting. Never been done before. Also, by the way, something that uh, took place in St. Petersburg. This is a healthy city initiative. So St. Petersburg joined the WHO Healthy City Initiative. Interestingly enough, so there have been so different, uh, different, 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 different programs, and uh, they did this massive, massive study. And, uh, well, we were part of it. And um, so, like I said, we faced some difficulties. Uh, it has been a very, very wide ranging study. So from global social to humanitarian, uh, but by and large, you see that uh, the overall situation is uh, getting aggravated because there's so many different turbulences uh, in human life. So naturally, people get more depressed, they uh, become less sure, and they want to live better, they want to have certainty in their life. But it's a big, big problem. It's such a multifaceted area. Uh, there's so much in between the lines, on the cusps, between different scientists. Uh, it's a very, very difficult thing to unravel. So we don't have any coordination uh, project office, you can call it, that would bring together multidisciplinary uh, professionals uh, to develop a particular program to, to eliminate it. It's almost impossible. So all we can do is uh, highlight it and uh, show what's going on. But of course, mental health uh, is systemic. It's ultimately the glued the whole society together. And it's something that uh, will be the key study uh, for different types of sciences. And we need, of course, to bring together different professionals. Uh, so we, these are social professionals, uh, IT professionals, uh, data scientists, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole point is to create a favorable living environment uh, to preserve mental health of our society. And that's what it's all about, keeping our people healthy. So, and uh, multiple factors have been identified that primarily affect uh, the situation. And uh, clearly, of course, social factors are among the most prevalent. Well, simply, it's just the lifestyle. The lifestyle, uh, what you see and what you face on a daily basis. Here's only some of them, such, such as low social status, work stress, uh, poor work-life balance, anxiety, depression, hostility, and things like that. And our study shows a very strong correlation between this uh, neurological uh, disorders and cardiovascular disorders. There's a very strong correlation between anxiety and uh, cardiovascular stress and disorders. Unfortunately, there's a very direct link between that. So it's what the leading, by the way. So a lot of the cardiovascular diseases are caused by neurological diseases and mental, uh, poor mental health, unfortunately. So we have the well, of, we've, we, we have tried to develop at least several big uh, programs to combat it. So several pr platforms, the three of them, such as the healthy population and people in the risk group, uh, the most vulnerable populations. Uh, these are mostly targeting uh, different healthcare professionals coming together, also mental literacy, things like that. So the, the different programs, some target the society, some target uh, healthcare professionals. And the long-term goal of this program, of course, is to make sure that we can combat all the negative trends and improve overall level of 
availability of a mental treatment and uh, generally improve the quality of mental health care. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is definitely not helping here. And a lot of that, of course, puts this on hold. You see this very sharp spike in uh, psychological and uh, mental uh, deviations up to 42.5%. Just a couple of words about the pandemic. Again, this is the challenge of our time. And every time you look at SARS, you look at uh, any other epidemic, there's always a strong correlation because people are uncertain and it's always spiking every single time. And COVID is not an exception. Has been unprecedented. So when people are so stressed, have to sit at home, they're isolated, they lose social connection, and uh, so far that the, the fact that you really don't want to, what to expect that the government comes up with different information all the time, and you have to wear masks and all that, so it causes massive, massive, massive stress, and um, not everyone can take it. People get you know rolled over, and this of course is a huge factor for this kind of spike. There's been multiple, multiple studies, short term and relatively long term. So we have enough statistics because it's been running for months. More or less, you can see what's been happening here. You can see correlation, of course. People are stressed, and uh, for sure, some of them turn to drugs, to alcohol, to other uh, substances of abuse. Uh, of course, we need to come together, we need to combat this because this is long-term damage to the mental health of society. So, by the way, we had our own study, we had, these are the scientists, so we published it later this uh, spring. We also did social demographic studies, so about 2,000 uh, people participated, so average age from 31 plus minus 12. And uh, men versus women, you see 84% were women, 16% uh, were men. So, and uh, uh, mostly women, of course, participated. Uh, women that have, in 50% of all cases, some somatic deviation, about 30% of all cases, some effective um, psychology related uh, disease. Uh, you can also see, uh, we, of course, we try to balance this respondents by 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 age right and marital status but by and large the overall level of stress is elevated and no wonder because women are more susceptible to this kind of stress than men and these are mostly people that are mostly have some sort of affective memory related disorders also young people are unemployed uh, single unmarried uh, without higher education and women so women are more susceptible to this stuff and the overall uh, the the by and large the overall majority had of course co-eluting factors so it's not like only one thing they had several elements going f at the same time and mostly anxiety and disorder of course such as a lack of drugs uh, availability and the risk of isolation a lack of job and things like that mostly of course about the uncertainty of this life and Dmitry already mentioned uh, the impact of social isolation on mental health the fact that we are hardwired to be social creatures and our results actually mimic it so you see Moscow St. Petersburg etc you see how many cases we have and uh, the level of diseases per uh, 100,000 people. So there's a direct correlation between people sitting at home and being isolated to being anxiety prone and uh, uh, overall level of stress. So overall, like I said, each and every single time we have some sort of an epidemic, like in case of SARS, for instance, there's always spiking. So always spiking, so pandemic and psychic health are always related, mostly causing depression anxiety uh, because people are unsure what to do and uh, I might say that uh, uh, so of course I mean we still haven't yet received the full impact of COVID-19 but uh, for sure uh, it's, it's a new thing and uh, in many ways an unprecedented way but Certain things are universal and the effect will be, of course, significant. The effect will be significant and, like I said, uh, we shouldn't just 
think about direct help to society in terms of money, but also in terms of their mental health. We need to support our people, help them survive, help them, uh, you know, maintain their mental health in this very, very unfavorable environment. Uh, and this particularly goes to physicians and uh, people related to healthcare that are contacting uh, these people in the first place. And there has to be a multidisciplinary study because COVID-19 has touched so many lives in so many different sectors. So we're not just looking at cognitive health, right? But we're also looking at holistically the whole body. So uh, there's been works in studies that say that the coronavirus also impacts the actual brain function, direct brain function. Somehow they link coronavirus to brain function, brain mole function. So pretty much across the globe, you see that uh, the overall number of cases is spiking. There's the mental health is deteriorating across the globe. A lot of that has to do with uh, depress depression and anxiety. And uh, as a result of that, the impact is uh, economic and social primarily. So the fact that uh, we all live in a stressed environment, uh, that is not a good environment, of course, to stabilize mental health for sure. And uh, of course, there's a direct correlation between level of income to level of mental health. So the lower the income, the lower the mental health. So, and that means that fighting poverty and uh, overall welfare is a major, major factor in maintaining overall mental health of people around the world. So that's all for me. Thank you very much.